Thank you. Uh, good morning, all of you, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to Assistant Systems Annual Conference Call for the Annual Results and for Q4 Results. I'm going to start by giving you a short uh, update in terms of the financial numbers. So the revenue for the year was $480.97 million, which was a 2.2% uh, year-on-year growth. In rupee terms, we had 11% growth, uh, and the total revenue was $33 billion, uh, rupees. Um, the EBITDA was at, had a 23.9% growth, and overall PAC was 3,516.79 million rupees. Now, in, for the quarter as such, the revenue was 118.30 million, which was a degrowth of 2.1%, and the PAC was 844.73 million rupees, which was a QOQB growth of 0.7, 7 7.9%. Uh, beyond these financial numbers, I'd like to report that the Board of Directors at its meeting concluded on the April 27th recommended final dividend of 3 rupees per share in the face value of 10 rupees each. And in, this is in addition to the interim dividend of 8 rupees per share that the board had declared in January 2019. The total dividend for the year was 11 rupees per share. Uh, clearly, this dividend is recommended by the board is subject to approval by the members during the annual general meeting. The board had approved a share buyback plan via the open market group for an amount of 2,250 million at a maximum buyback rate of 750 rupees per share. As of April 26, 2019, the company had purchased 2,230,113 shares for a total value of 1,421.71 million rupees, representing 63% of the total buyback size. Uh, I'd like to also report that uh, we have Chris O'Connor here who joined us on February 25th as the uh, CEO. The board appointed him as an executive director in the board uh, during this board meeting. Uh, I'd like to also announce that uh, Sandeep Kalra, who used to be at Harman and Samsung, has joined as the, will join as the president of the Technology Services Unit on May 1st, that is tomorrow in California. Um, with this, I'm going to hand it to Sunil to give you a little bit of an overview on the, uh, the financial numbers, and I'll take this back make a few introductions, and then have to share his experience with the company for the last uh, two months. So, yeah. Thank you, Anand, and good morning to everyone. You have heard, uh, Anand, on a few updates and some of the leadership changes that we've had in the organization. So let me explain the financial performance for the quarter and the year ended 31st March 2019. So revenue for the quarter at $118.3 million was lower by 2.1% quarter on quarter. On YOI basis, it was higher by 1.2%. In INR terms, the revenue was Rs. 8.319 million, which was lower by 3.7% on Q2 basis, and on YOI basis, it was higher by 10.5%. So for this quarter, as you are aware, Q4 of the fiscal, which is the first quarter of the calendar year, is seasonally weak for the IP led revenue, as the customers are just starting their new fiscal in the U.S. and budgets are getting allocated. So this is a seasonality we have been seeing in our business that the Q1 and Q3 of our uh, fiscal year are stronger and Q2 and Q4 are weaker. The linear revenue grew by 2.3% year two, while the IP led revenue as anticipated was lower by 15.4%. So on an overall basis, if you see vis-a-vis the last quarter of the last financial year, our growth in the services revenues, that is the technology services revenue, helped us to uh, offset some of the IP revenue decline, and hence the net revenue decline was not very high. For the full year FY19, revenue came in at 480.97 million with a YOI growth of 2.2%, and in INR terms, the revenue was 33659 million rupees with YOI growth of 11%. Now, within this 2.2% growth, the growth in linear revenue was 3.2%, while the IP revenue was lower by 0.5%. So 
In respect of linear revenue, the increase in volume was 1.7 percent, and billing rate was up by 0.6 percent. The on-site linear revenue grew by 2.7 percent, constituted by decline of 1.2 percent in volume and an increase in billing rate of 4 percent. Offshore linear revenue grew by 2 percent, comprised of growth in volume by 2.2 percent, and billing rate declined by about 0.1 percent. The lower IP leg revenue. In this quarter, coupled with INR appreciation, has had an adverse impact on margin. So you would find at gross margin level and at EBITDA margin level, an impact of these two elements. However, this has been partially offset by cost optimization, both on site and uh, better utilization of the delivery resources in uh, the overall services portfolio. So overall, the gross margin came in at 36.8 percent, as against 38.2 percent in the previous quarter. Moving on to SG&D expenses, the sales and marketing expense was in range. While we have had higher sales and business development headcount, there was reversal of sales incentive provision due to lower than target achievement for some of the sales people. G&D expense was higher, as it includes the provision of rupees 182.5 million towards the probable impairment of deposits with island affairs. So currently, the provision that we have made reflects the exposure that may arise given the uncertainty around island affairs. The impact of this provision on EBITDA was 2.2 percent for the quarter and 0.5 percent for the full year. After this provision, the EBITDA for the quarter was between 1 to 6.5 million at 15.2 percent of revenue, as against 19.7 percent of the previous quarter. Excluding this provision, the EBITDA would have been 17.4%. For the full year, EBITDA was rupees 5805 million at 17.2% of revenue, as against 15.5% in the previous year. Depreciation and amortization was 4.5% of revenue, as against 4.6% in the previous quarter, as a couple of products have completed their amortization cycle. The EBIT was rupees 889 million at 10.7% of revenue, as against 15.1% in the preceding quarter. The EBIT for two years was 12.6 percent, as against 10.2 percent in FY18. The Treasury income for Q4 was rupees 283 million, as against rupees 229 million during the previous quarter. This is on account of end to end gain on long term mutual funds and higher interest income. The foreign exchange loss was lower at rupees 59 million, as against rupees 241 million in the previous quarter. With this, the PDT was. 1113 million at a margin of 13.4 percent as against 15 percent in the previous quarter, and for the full year, PBT was 14.4 percent versus 14.1 percent in the last year. The effective tax rate for the quarter was at 24.1 percent as against 29.2 percent in the previous quarter, which is primarily due to R&D tax credit that we get on certain development expenses in other countries. On a going forward basis, we expect the EPR to be in the range of 27 to 28 percent. PAT for the quarter was rupees 845 million at 10.2 percent as against 10.6 percent in the previous quarter. For the full year, PAT was rupees 3517, an increase in million and increase of 8.8 percent over the previous year. And at a margin level, PAT margin was 10.4 percent as against 10.6 percent in the previous year. On the operational capex, we had a spend of rupees 575 million and the cash on books. Amounts to rupees 14798 million as at 31st March 2019, as compared to 15015 million as at 31st December 2018. The value of forward contracts we have on books as of 31st March 19 is 112 million at an average rate of rupees 73 per dollar. With this, uh, thanks everyone, and I'll be back to Amit. Uh, thank you, Sunil. Uh, so let me uh, share with you some of the highlights of. Or likely questions that you might have. So first, I want to acknowledge the fact that we had a tough year this year, and uh, growth rate was much lower than we had anticipated. Some of the key reasons for this growth rate decline would be to do with the top one customer uh, declining in terms of our revenue with them. But this is for two reasons. One is some of the IP revenues were lower, and also their challenges also caused some of our numbers in that one to go lower. The positive that you might look at is that even though the top one percent, top one customer declined, the overall 
alliance business we by about 7% because of various other businesses that we are doing in the context of our top one customer in their ecosystem that has grown significantly during this year some of it being very seller business some of the accelerated ip also declined which caused the ip numbers to go down uh, we had at the beginning of the year uh, a rather slow staffing ramp up Uh, which contributed to the slowness in the Q1 and Q2 businesses, and also the Q2 was a challenge where some of the key customers or two customers of ours actually uh, ended their project with us, which caused the Q2 numbers to go down. Overall, many of these things I would say are attributed to internal challenges rather than really um, market, which has been fairly upbeat, and I we do see uh, very good growth and activity in many of the key new areas that we are working on. Um, I just want to share with you a couple of next steps that we are doing, which uh, would be of interest to you. So we have a sales kickoff for our sales team planned on the 29th, 30th, and 31st in Boston, and we are proposing to do an investor day in Mumbai with Chris sharing his vision as to where we are going. He completes 100 days on June 5th, and in the week of 10th to June 10th, there will be the 13th. We are planning to do an investor meet in uh, Mumbai where we will share with you what. The financial year FY20 looks like. Uh, I want to hand this off to Chris, but I want to mention that Chris has been a persistent customer for nearly 10 years. He has worked with us in various parts of his uh, job at IBM, and more recently he was uh, part of the IBM Watson IoT business where he was the general manager. I'm really delighted to have Chris on board, and he has been in the company for almost two months. So I'm going to hand it to Chris to share with us. Uh, what he has seen so far and what his plan is, and after that we will take questions. Well, right, thank you, and uh, to everybody here, good morning, and thank you for having me on the call. I look forward to meeting many of you in the months to come. Uh, I've been at the company for 64 days now. I've spent about a month in the United States working in our primary market, understanding the clients and the working structure that we have in place there. I've spent the remaining time uh, in India. As well as a short brief trip to Europe to learn our business there at the same time. I've spent my time doing three fundamental activities: first, learning the people; second, learning the business and refining its structures with actions already in place; uh, and last, working with the clients. Uh, and I'm to the point right now where, around key deals where I have background in subject matter uh, contribution, I'm helping to rest deals at this point where I want to go forward better. So it's been an exciting first 64 days. Uh, and I am here in uh, Pune right now, and uh, we'll be back uh, in market uh, in uh, another couple hours, and uh, we'll be continue to be active there. And I look forward to seeing you guys all in June. Uh, I think the linear business that we have is, is fantastic. We've got great stories from our clients waiting to tell to the market, uh, and I think it is on us to tell those stories. Uh, by the data I see, I'm optimistic. That we are on top of our delivery staffing at this point in time, as I'm indicated from last year to this year, uh, and for the machine I see running, you know, we will see a continued steeper, better, simple delivery-oriented top revenue uh, on top of our business that's being run. Uh, and so uh, it's it's been a real thrill to learn that business, uh, as well as to, to see the mechanisms that are now in place uh, on our IT-led revenue. Uh, we continue to enhance it, which is exciting to see. Uh, I have a broad view of this business from my background, as I've indicated, as well as I, as a client, have done nearly all of the IP-led models that are possible with the system as a company. Uh, so I know this business very well. Uh, there are several steps we're taking to enhance that business uh, beyond our primary first client or top client with additional partners, as well as there are multiple models of revenue that we can add around royalty, reselling product services. And new persistent-based IP that can be added into the mix to give us multiple ways to stack revenue. So it's exciting to be a part of taking that into next year. Uh, we have a breadth of partnerships that we can use around our IP business, uh, and it gives us the opportunity to position ourselves as a category owner going forward on areas such as data, AI, machine learning, and industrial sector. So I'm excited to be here, and uh, I look forward to working with you in the future. Adam, back to you. Thank you. Let's open the floor for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question, may please press star and one on your touchdown telephone. If you wish to reveal yourself in the question queue, 
you may press star into participants I request the PU answer while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question gets in. The first question is from the Lion of God of Ratheria from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey Anand, couple of questions. Firstly, uh, based on the changes we have made at the organization, how have these changes been received uh, by people? Have you seen any uh, reflection of that in terms of higher attrition rates? Uh, and what has been the client feedback? Well, actually, uh, the reception has been pretty good. I think overall, we've been very transparent to the, with the company in the context of how we were going through the CEO hire. I think we had mentioned here as well that about two quarters back that this process was on. And uh, there were uh, several people who participated in that process. So we have had actually no attrition because of new management team that has come in. And uh, so the uh, response from the customers has been also very positive. There is continuity in what we are doing right now. I'm very much part and available to meet the customers. And I hope to spend more time on it. Chris has met uh, several customers on his own, and we met several together. And overall, the, the feedback has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, Andeep joins tomorrow and, uh, you know, he has not met customers yet, but I hope in the next 30 days he will be quite up to speed and if we can get him here as well, during the investor day you will be able to meet him as well. But I think there has been no real, uh, you know, concern in terms of the transition that we have announced. Sure. Second question is for uh, Chris. Uh, on the IP-led revenue, uh, what do you think is the key uh, driver going forward? Uh, is it going to be a change in uh, sales strategy or is it going to be uh, a change in the way uh, we are aligned to some of the products? Uh, any you know, first cut uh, will be helpful. I, I believe, as I mentioned, uh, we need to enhance our business. Our business is very good. We have the opportunity to add uh, other business models too, which give us greater selling power and uh, I'll call it category power around the places where we have IP business. So opportunities such as reselling and our own IP as well as our own service structure around these areas, let, let us fill out, a, I think, a richer part of the portfolio which lets us sell a little deeper. And that's going to be exciting. Okay. Last question is for Sunil. Uh, the margin performance in fiscal 19 has been quite good uh, despite uh, muted revenue growth. Uh, how, how to think about margins going forward uh, and any upfront investment uh, you're thinking uh, as far as fiscal 20 is concerned? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, FY20, uh, oh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, Hello. Excuse me, sir, this is the operator. We're not able to hear you. Uh, hello, member. Hello. Thank you. Uh, sir, your audio is sounding very soft. Is this any better? Yes, sir. This is much better. Thank you. In fact, we got a review. You are able to hear, Gaurav? Uh, Gaurav? Gaurav? Yeah, if you can repeat, that will be helpful. Yeah, I will do that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I was saying that uh, we will use the lever starting with revenue, the optimization and, you know, monetization of assets that we have built over the last couple of years. And uh, the on-site utilization, which has some headroom for growth, despite all the challenges that we have in terms of uh, cost management in the current context of talent crunch, I think we are in a position to hold on margins. And if we build on further momentum and enhance IP revenue, as Chris mentioned, that will add uh, kicker to the margin. So we do expect margins to be steady, and we'll invest uh, in growth, but not let margins uh, get impacted. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is from the line of Madhu Babu from Central Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir, congrats on a good uh, free cash flow generation. 
So how should we see the capital allocation? Because almost we have 1450 crore of cash on balance sheet and we are generating 400 crore kind of free cash flow per year, including the interest income. So should we expect these buybacks to be an annual phenomena from here on? I think uh, it's a good question, but I hope that's not the phenomenon. Uh, we want to use the cash that we have right now at least for a couple of quick acquisitions. Uh, we have a new team in place, and the team is looking at what may be the, the best set of uh, gaps that we need to fill. So how do we look at maybe two or three different uh, acquisitions that we fill the gaps that we have? So I think it's a much better point that we should answer this question after 12 months, but right now, we have some ideas on what we are looking for, and uh, hopefully uh, that's what the new management is going to guide us on. Uh, and another thing on the IBM ecosystem, I think we have seen HCL Tech uh, doing multiple deals and you know trying to uh, uh, take over some of the products. And obviously because they have become so close to IBM, would we see any risk of vendor consolidation and we losing out our portion of business from the IBM channel? Thanks. Uh, okay, so I, I'm not so concerned about it. We have met all the executives at IBM, and uh, we don't see that uh, as a huge risk at the moment, actually. Uh, we actually see a different set of opportunities with our large customer predominantly because of the acquisition that they have made of, uh, you know, Red Hat, which is a fairly large number uh, that they are spending, and they have defined the next generation strategy around cloud and various other things. So we feel fairly comfortable about the uh, Businesses, IT businesses that we currently have, one. We also are comfortable with the, the services business that we have, though we do expect challenges in terms of growth rates in that business for a different reason. And we do think that there are new opportunities in terms of new business opportunities for us, especially considering the roadmap that we expect from IBM after the, their acquisition is completed. Okay, so thanks. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. That is from the line of Sankar Chudu from JF Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Anand, you mentioned uh, uh, the weak growth that we had this year was largely because of internal challenges. Uh, so if I uh, step back, uh, I think uh, last year around first or second quarter, we had effected uh, some changes in our uh, sales uh, uh, programs and the account management uh, structure. Uh, that does not seem to have uh, so far led to any kind of impact. Uh, obviously, we have now gone for some leadership changes as well. So I'm just trying to understand that what is uh, the, basically your assessment of the challenges really uh, when you're talking about the internal challenges and uh, what are you planning to do uh, you know, further on these areas and when do you think that we can look for growth coming back because of these changes in the leadership that you've spoken about? No, so I think... Uh if you look at the, the basic performance of the company in the last two quarters, that has been better than the first two quarters. And part of the reason for that has been the fact that we have made the changes that we had mentioned. So um, our higher ch first half was really the biggest challenge that we had. But if you look at the numbers in terms of non-IP business, the fact that services and digital have grown at a certain rate during the last two quarters, part of that has to do with the fact that we've been able to staff people faster. Uh, the other challenge, if you look at it, or I wouldn't say it's really a challenge, but what has what we have seen in the last two quarters is that the percentage of offshore business has actually gone up as compared to the on-site business, which makes it harder to see per person revenue going down. But overall, profit margin on an offshore business is a lot better than it is on-site. So it's a balancing act every time you move more and more work to offshore. I expect that offshore trend to increase next year as well, considering the fact that visas and other challenges that are happening in the U.S. make it very difficult to hire local people. We also expect rates to go up because of that. So I think uh, overall, I'm, I think next year should be quite okay for us in terms of the actual changes that we have made. Uh, I think Chris has been already on board for nearly 60 days, and he's quite familiar with the business. I think Q1 will be his quarter, and I feel pretty good about what I'm handing off to him. Sure. So, uh, so if I look at last couple of quarters also, the YY growth is still in a low single digit kind of a, a state. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out that next year should it still be a build out year in which we may still be doing better than FY19, but we may still not catch up with the industry growth. And maybe only over uh, maybe 21, 22 is when we can see a, a more uh, stronger growth coming back. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, 
Well, I think uh, it's not exactly a fair assessment, but I don't want to really comment on it. I think uh, we have to demonstrate this through real performance. So I think it's Q1 is a key number. Q2 would be a build on that. And Q3 and Q4 will follow. So let me not say a whole lot at this moment. Uh, but I'm quite confident about what the customers are telling us. I'm very confident about the delivery capabilities that we have built out. We have hired new, new sales people who are already on board. So this is a, an ongoing transition. So this is not an abrupt change here. And I feel very comfortable about what I'm handing off to Chris for Q1. Sure. And just lastly, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, pricing is, is improving and as well as we are going to do probably more offshoring. And these obviously, both of them are going to give us a significant margin lever. Uh, whereas Sunil's commentary earlier was more around a stable kind of a margin outlook. So I'm just wondering where these uh, uh, these gains are likely to get deployed. Well, I think, uh, see, as I said, you know, we, uh, rather Chris mentioned this already, so I, I do expect increased sales and marketing expense a bit. Uh, we do expect uh, further growth in our marketing budgets. I think uh, this is what Chris would point out, and what we have observed is that we are uh, not representing us as well as we could. Uh, we need to tell better stories to, for the work we have done. And uh, you know, I'll let Chris comment a bit on this, but overall, uh, I do see the margins being maintained, but we will spend more on uh, sales and marketing. So if I can add on to that, it's a great question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we see an ability to buy, to, to drive some pent up demand with the uh, focus on telling our stories. I, I, I wouldn't yet call that a dramatic increase in spending, but there does need to be a focus on telling the stories of some of the excellent clients we have. Uh, the second part of this is that we, we do see a relationship between the feet on the street and our ability to drive more clients and, and return revenue as well. And uh, so we're rising to meet that. Something outrageous, but I think it's important that we rise to meet where we can uh, drive greater float and, and top line revenue. Uh, the last point I'd, I'd go to is um, we have the opportunity to play with different mix of products uh, and capabilities for different types of, of margin, uh, and uh, we see that to our advantage to do so as well, particularly around the IP net businesses. It lets us uh, play different, so to speak, around those strong partnerships. Uh, with different offerings we can put around it that the team had already started before I got here, and we'll continue to do that that allow us to change uh, uh, the components of our business that will come in at different margins. Got it. Uh, thank you, and all the best. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is on the line of Ankur Udra from CLSA. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, maybe I just want to build up on the previous question. Oh, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Rudra. So there's a lot of disturbance from your life. Is it clear enough? Much better. Yes, Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Anand, you know, you said, I just want to build up a bit on the previous question. You said there were several challenges, but, you know, we seem to be having almost maybe 10 quarters of missing peer group average on growth. If you just step back and think on a very broad level, what are the learnings on, you know, what did not work out in the last two or so years? Where do you see changes are needed in the business in terms of focus or strategic areas, you know, between, you know, what you and Chris have decided so far? And, you know, as part of that, what will your continuing role in the uh, business be? Uh, no, so uh, if you look at actually, I'm not so sure in the 10 quarter year number we are that far off, but overall, you know, if you look at what we could be doing, yes, we have missed numbers and we could have been doing a lot better. And many of those uh, challenges have been to do with the fact that, you know, we have been transitioning our business from a traditional outsourced product development business to a combination of IP led business along with a lot of digital and uh, working with enterprises. And some of those have been a, has been a bumpy ride in certain cases. But I think uh, as we look at the next set of people that we have gotten in and this team, uh, they have better experience on both IP. And if you combine that with what Sandeep brings in, I think uh, I'm pretty optimistic of what can happen. Now, clearly, the numbers have to be demonstrated by showing quarter on quarter results. And uh, you know that's what I would say in terms of what might be the next few quarters as such. Um, but there is enough opportunity in the market, so I'm not too, I, mean, I do believe that there is enough for us to do, and uh, we are in a fairly good spot in that context. In terms of what I plan to do for in the future, so my current plan is to sort of look at um, some of the technical areas that we work with and sort of focus a lot more on uh, what are the strategic imperatives in the market, what are the changes and the shifts that are happening in the market. And I'm looking at uh, talking to several customers who are our leading customers 
where technology shifts happen, and that's sort of my plan for the next few months, at least. And then uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, that all. That's okay. Uh, I'd like to add on uh, in terms of uh, what Anand's going to do next. Uh, I don't think we'll be far from it. Uh, and in fact, I think we'll be talking and working together in a daily mode. Uh, one of the things I guess I'd point out, which Anand mentioned at the very beginning, is I'm a 10-year client of Anand. And uh, to be here is a privilege. And uh, he and I will continue to maintain the strong relationship we had prior uh, through this entire uh, work that we're doing now. And uh, uh, his, uh, his set of work that he's done is invaluable, and uh, I intend to keep it close and uh, him closer uh, in the work that we'll do in the coming uh, year uh, through this transition. That is helpful. And it may be a bit early to ask this question, but do you perceive any changes in focus or strategic bets going forward? Uh, maybe Chris can answer that. I, I think, um, I think as we articulated, we have we have a multi-pronged business, so we have several different areas to to explore. Um, the linear business, uh, you know, we continue to refine, uh, and um, you know, the ability to expand that business and to cross sell up sell on that becomes you know, something that I think we can perfect another level. Uh, in terms of the IP business. Um, we, we have the opportunity to be a category owner inside of that business in some of the places where we participate. And a category owner then can ingratiate us not only to our major large clients, but also to other people that are in the same ecosystem. Uh, and, and we intend to thoroughly explore that. We appear to have permission by the whims that we have already to, to be this person in the marketplace uh, and, uh, and play with multiple platforms that, uh, that let us position ourselves as the expert in the category or the domain. Uh, which, which puts us in a great position, and we'll explore that. It's a build on top of what we're already doing. I would not call it a radical change. All right. Thank you, and best of luck. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is from the line of Rahul Jain from MK Global. Please go ahead. <coughs> yeah, hi. Uh, two questions. Uh, firstly, for Anand, uh, if you could give the drivers for growth in digital business. This year was weak on start, but picked up gradually. So can we say that we should aspire for similar to market rate growth rate in the range of 20, 30 percent, or we are uh, away from that right now? Well, I think uh, we are in good shape for looking at those kinds of numbers. Again, you know, I don't want to put out a big number at this moment and not make it, so let's go Q and Q. But I think the big drivers that we have are some of the partners that we have. So we have very good partnership with Salesforce, and uh, we see that partnership strengthening. We have made some very good uh, deliveries and products that we have built on the ecosystem. For example, one of the loan origination systems that we have built out in India has started to deliver good results for us. We have several such successes in the healthcare area as well with Salesforce. Um, we are today, uh, you know, nearly their top 20 sales partners as well worldwide, and I think that will bring us much better opportunity there. We also have very good partnerships now with some of the next layer of players such as Appian and Out Systems and others, and also the RPSA. So there are a set of partnerships that we are looking at in terms of the digital activities. Also, our Amazon status on the partnership has gone up quite significantly. We are now an advanced partner in three or four areas, and that's helping us see some leads. So there was a bunch of investments that we did in the last year which were not entirely visible during the year. We both like, you know, during the next quarter, you'll see some of these. Great. And uh, secondly, for Chris, uh, welcome, sir, and congratulations for your new, new assignment. But if you could share your top reason that inclined you to take up this responsibility, and what are your specific comments on the persistent as a vendor, and thus, uh, what were the strengths of the company, and what are the areas that you would like them to contribute and give a boost up so that uh, we mine the IBM world far deeper and wider? So um, I'm happy to help you with the first question. I'll let you need some more definition on the second one of, of what you asked. Um, uh, on the first question, um, uh, I think as mentioned, uh, Anand and I have been uh, working together for 10 years. Uh, and um, I've I worked in a variety of roles in that relationship. Great opportunity to uh, partner not only with Anand, but with other people across the industry. And as you develop uh, you know, inside of a large company, you, you decide so whether you want to be entirely corporate or whether you uh, start to fall in love with a certain, certain area of the industry and technology. Uh, and um, you know, as, as a person, 
this is a great shift for my desire to help uh, an area of technology and the industry grow. Uh, and uh, IBM has a long policy of executives that have gone to their key partners and played significant roles. And so this is a very friendly thing uh, to move from IBM into one of the key partners uh, and uh, and work with them then in the future of growth and uh, enablement. And so uh, it's uh, it's a natural thing, uh, and we can point back to multiple uh, places in IBM's history uh, where they have welcomed and, 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 and been a strong part of uh, working with key executives to go lead key partners. Uh, and uh, the system has built a key relationship there as well as I had a key relationship. So it plays, uh, it plays very well. And so uh, it's just a great fit all around uh, with all the needs of everybody. But you can help me some more with the second question. Yeah, yeah, just to re-articulate that. So basically in simple words, uh, we have multiple uh, way we do business with uh, IBM and the Alliance. Uh, be it engineering side, be it on the IoT, uh, CCLM, reselling. What are the areas where you could, uh, uh, you know, contribute where you think uh, somewhere persistent uh, could have strengthened that aspect of it and could have taken it to the next level and what is that you would be working on? Because if you look at uh, the size of the revenue that we are uh, doing here versus the total opportunity, I mean, that, that's a huge, huge number. So what, what we would do here to uh, change some of the things uh, to a different level altogether? My, my, my thought practices are two ways. Uh, my first thought process is on our number one client and continuing to enhance and, and encourage that revenue model. Uh, and if you look at from where it started to where we are today, uh, in the simplest form when it started, we added people to help our teams. Uh, in its complicated form today, we are product owners, we are producers of capability, we receive revenue, uh, in a variety of ways beyond just simple people, time, and materials uh, that include other, other mechanisms for payment. Uh, and, and that model can continue with that large client to flourish and grow even deeper. Uh, as we write persistent-based IP that we can sell for our own margin rate, uh, it lets us enter the opportunity to become a value-added reseller, uh, which, is, which is more than just a provider of services. We provide domain expertise. We provide software. We, we build software for that client, and uh, we work with them as a category owner to help advance the total marketplace around the acceptability of the need for that, that capability, which is beyond software. So it's, it's a very unique possibility for us that we see in, in current deals to do what I call revenue stacking, which is multiple different methods for the system to deliver value uh, with the partner. And, and bring in different marginalization rates at the same time, all the way up to the marginalization rate of standard software, which, which really changes our stance in the business. Um, the second thing is, yeah, that's a pattern. And so to do it with that large client is certainly an action that we want to take place and, and I'll be uh, directly involved with. Uh, to do it again with other partners is something that we've been approached about doing. Uh, and, and in non-competitive ways with our large clients. But there are other people that have platforms that have looked at this and, and would like to explore the same types of possibilities. So in a go-forward matter, uh, I'll be working that as well. And it really gives us a different dynamic to, to the company to build that revenue model in addition to our linear model, uh, which, we, which we talked about at night. So I'll be focused on both of those aspects heavily uh, in terms of driving our growth. All right, right. That's quite helpful. And if I may squeeze in one more. Uh, for, uh, for we're going to give you a very short answer, though, because we are running low on time. Yeah. So go ahead, Raul, last question. Yeah, uh, for Sunil, I mean, uh, basically on the utilization uh, front, uh, are we, uh, are we uh, good equipped uh, for uh, this year group to be captured on the current base, or there would be a commitment on uh, further addition during the year that we have already uh, worked on? So we have added, uh, you know, people on the offshore side who have seen significant account growth over the last two quarters. We are getting back, uh, you know, internal uh, reskilling along with uh, lateral hires that we need in certain specific areas. So far as on site is concerned, the talent crunch has certain issues that the ability of uh, people to be available at the right time and the right place is at times a challenge. So we're working on that to fix that particular piece as uh, 
So in the last couple of quarters, we've intensified that effort. But uh, I think overall, the staffing situation has its own challenges. We continue to be on the guard to staff requirements and build it into the model based on the focus that we get on the exact skill requirement. Tradition would continue uh, to address this. Yeah, I think we will continue to hire this year as well. And uh, this is a continuous process. Let's move on, Raul. We can take your questions offline. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Raul. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shaker Swing from Excel your Capital. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Just wanted to know, like, uh, is there any specific reason why you're not giving a revenue guidance? And uh, second thing is, can you give a guidance on the margins and on the capex? Um, see, again, we have not been giving guidance for quite some time, partly because one is the volatility of the market makes it very hard to give guidance, and we find that uh, providing guidance has no real upside in some sense, in some sense because you know, at the end of it, what matters is what you deliver. So that's sort of where it is. I think uh, we will be able to give you a kind of where we are heading in the investor conference that we are hosting in June, because by then Chris would have had his three months, hundred days in the business. He would have you know, gotten the strategy or at least the execution plans on place, and we would have a much better view of where we are headed. So I think we'll do that. Uh, maybe if we need to do an additional call at that time, but that's when it's the best time to talk about it. Um, in terms of your uh, other question regarding guidance and margins, all we are saying is that, you know, we can maintain the current margins, and uh, while we do see expenses going up on various accounts, we think the growth rate that we will have and the fact that, you know, we are looking at all of the numbers going on, we'll be able to maintain margins because offshoring is going to increase as a percentage of our, and that will help in improving the margin. Uh, regarding capex, uh, I don't really have a specific number to share at the moment, but uh, we can take that offline if you have that. Also, like the offshore going up by on site actually not doing that well, uh, that is a sort of a negative signal, na? because if you so have. You because if your new project starts, then that is an indication of new business coming in, and that will be uh, more or less on site. And having more of offshore without any, uh, without a equivalent increase in on site is actually not a very positive signal. No, actually that's not true. But uh, you know what is happening is that there is lack of availability on site, and people are very familiar with uh, how to get done work done offshore. We have done it with many customers. Uh -huh. so I'm not at all worried about the fact that we can do more offshore. It, it is uh, per revenue count goes down, but profitability increases. That is fine, but uh, say like when a project start ha start happens, when you get a new project, uh, isn't it true that a uh, significant portion has to be done on site? Not really. You know that's not. It all depends on what the project is. Okay. Uh, let's keep moving, if you don't mind. We have okay. just a few minutes left today. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aputva Prasad from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, Anand. Uh, while you touched upon this earlier, if you can, uh, maybe give a more medium-term outlook. Uh, I understand that uh, you're going to be doing the meet next yeah, month, but uh, anything in terms of uh, how to make the business model more predictable in terms of uh, whether uh, de-risking from top account is, is one thing that you're looking at more from a medium-term perspective. Um, see, I think uh, in the medium-term perspective, we are trying to move more and more business on the enterprise side of the market as compared to the IHV market, which is really what uh, the medium-term strategy at the moment is. And to do that, we are looking at partnerships such as Salesforce and others that I talked about. We are looking at cloud data security as the key sort of technology aspects, and we are looking at three industry segments, namely financial services, healthcare, and the industrial market. So that's really where our focus is, and I think uh, I'm quite optimistic that if we execute well, some of the challenges that we've had will be addressed, and we should see significant growth in all these areas. So, I mean, so what, what I think the market is pretty good. There's no real problem there. Yeah, but anything in terms of you know improving our predictability, because that's that's obviously something which which has not been the case uh, relative to fear. So, anything in terms of uh, maybe focusing more on existing accounts or uh, could be cross-sell a lot more uh, in your assessment of changes, particularly to drive growth in uh, these services and digital piece? So we are focusing on driving growth in the digital and services piece for sure. That's, that is the plan, and as I mentioned, 
Modi's enterprise digital projects that we are talking about are all in that area. That said, you know, the overall objective is to focus on growth and not necessarily just on the quarter on quarter growth. But yeah, I mean, I understand your concern and the predictability of it, but uh, let me not say too much at this moment. We will watch and go. Sure. And, and just one more, if I can squeeze in now, you mentioned uh, about acquisitions. So anything that you can talk about in terms of size or uh, the white spaces that we need to pick up? No, so as I said, you know, we have 215 million US dollars in our balance sheet at the moment in cash and reserves. So essentially, if you look at what we are looking at or where the gaps are, we are looking for more domain related capabilities. We are also looking at our diversification in the European market. Those would be the two vectors that we would look at. And of course, you know, some of this activity is ongoing at the moment as to identifying where the gaps are and also more importantly, where the growth is. So you will look at acquisitions that are growth oriented rather than additive. At this moment, I'm going to not say too much more at this time. I uh, think we'll be able to answer this in greater detail in June because there's so many things happening at the moment with Sandeep joining tomorrow, Chris just here for 60 days. There's a lot of internal activity going on at the moment and uh, we'll have better results and better commentary in the next quarter and we'll show some of it on, in the June meeting that we have. Sure, sure. Thanks, Norman. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankit Gupta from Sam India. Please go ahead. Hi, Tim. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my first question is regarding uh, the IP-led revenue. I just wanted to understand uh, the trend here in terms of pricing and volume specifically. So if you could help out on that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, um, So, yeah, the, see, okay, let me sort of give you a little bit of uh, what's happening in the IP revenue and then I'll share with you what the trend is. So if you look at our IP revenue right now, so there are, I would say, four buckets of revenue that you would see in the IP part of what we do. So one set is around Accelerate. The second set is with our largest customer where we have revenue share agreements with customers. Third case, we have some of our own new IP that we have built out. And in the fourth case, we have reseller and other things that's also uh, being shown as IP direct revenue because we are selling IP as part of the whole equation that we have there. Now, if you look at all these four, they have very different characteristics. The revenue that we have from um, Accelerate has traditionally been on end-of-life products and products that we have acquired from some of our ISV partners. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot of acquisitions in the last uh, two years, so that has contributed to the decline in that market, but I expect more of those coming in this year. Uh, the IBM ones that we talked about, we have already discussed that, and uh, um, you know much about it, so I'm not going to comment a whole lot. Some of the new IPs, we are starting to see some traction, let's see how those perform. And the VAR business that Chris talked about, which is, is the next version of what we are trying to do with the reseller works version, is again likely to be the real focus for us in the next year. And uh, uh, you will see improved revenues on that for sure. So, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is from the line of Sameer Kutubali from Amit Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Uh, coming to the title holder attrition, I'm sure we must have done an exercise to understand what is driving this attrition. Any qualitative color on this will be helpful. Uh, if it is purely coincidental or there is some factor which is driving this. If so, what are the measures we have taken to arrest this and how confident are we that it will not continue going forward? Thanks. Are uh, you referring to employee attrition, right? In general, uh, at the leadership level as well. No, I, I think there yeah, the leadership attrition partly has to do with the fact that we have decided we are making a change in the strategy. So some of this leadership attrition was also forced in some sense. But if you look at the rest of the attrition numbers, that they have gone up from uh, to about 16 and a half percent at the moment. And uh, while that's a cause for concern, it's not a cause for alarm at the moment. Uh, we have put in several conditions and activities that we have planned. And also some salary raises have already happened uh, in terms of key, key specific things. Uh, some of the promotions have taken place. And uh, I think as growth starts to happen, more and more people feel like there is alignment in terms of what they are doing and what the company is doing. And I think some of that will help in reducing the attrition. So I mean, the reason why this is happening is partly because you know, overall the market is growing and uh, you know, everyone is, a lot of the attrition is partly because of 
not so much people leaving us, but because people are being hired by someone else. Sure, sir. Thanks. That's it, sir. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. That is from the line. Yeah, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Anand, I just had a question on the CPLM business and if we perhaps look at the run rate within that outside of the retailing, uh, it would have come down, uh, I am assuming, from the rates uh, maybe a couple of years back. So uh, obviously that's one segment that's not gone according to plan and part of it is the visibility. Obviously there's not a lot of control that you have on how much IBM sells. But what is the view that you're taking on that particular segment from here on going forward since it's still a substantial chunk of uh, the revenue? Yeah, let me ask uh, Chris to answer that question because I think he already give you both sides of the answer. Yeah, so um, what you are right is um, some of the better of this that's not in our control. And while we, uh, we receive revenue as a royalty, uh, you know, we can't always drive all the sales. Uh, so, uh, so that has a degree of some variability. Uh, if you look at the market space, that this capability is in that market space is completely alive, it's viable, uh, it is growing, uh, it's a major part of the Internet of Things in terms of large industrial companies needing to associate um, an understanding of how software is managed on industrial equipment, everything from machines to cars to robots to, to airplanes, etc. Uh, and so this is, this is a healthy market space. And, uh, we have, as a part of working with uh, the large client, uh, uh, key experts on our team. We have built, over the past years, a sales capacity that goes along with it to start to drive our own destiny, uh, so to speak, with our own sales, feeding our own loyalty. Uh, and we have built uh, IT around this, which has given us the opportunity to partner with others around this space who play at the same time. Uh, and so it, it, well, if we do this step correctly, we continue to partner well with our large client. Uh, we continue to build around the category with other spaces in the market, uh, and we established the persistent brand as a category expert uh, with multiple different vendors' platforms being uh, uh, our market space to play in, which is a unique place compared to everybody else in the industry. Uh, so on that, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely bullish, uh, and I've seen the elements in some of our first deals of this actually taking place now that Anand made the investment and well, the additional capabilities to bear, to bear around our own sales team and our own abilities to build IT. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's a careful sidestep and continued partnership move that we do. I have one comment, one last thing I would like to add to this, Ashish. Mm -hmm. uh, we have looked at uh, the numbers that we get in terms of the royalty that we get on this particular product for the last several years. And while it has been low this year, we find that this was an aberration rather than a reality in terms of where this would be. We think that the next year this number looks already a lot better because there is no real customer attrition. We sort of know why this number was lower last, last year. And there's some structural issues on that in terms of why it was lower on a three-year target. And uh, you know, while I don't want to go into the details of it, we do believe that next year this number should lo look a lot better just structurally uh, looking at how, the, how our partners sell these products. Yeah, I think this would be the last question that we would take. Uh, we are sort of at the top of the hour. So, ready? Uh, uh, sure. Sir. The last question will be from the line of Ravi Menon from Alara Security. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, just want to check. Yeah, you said that yeah, this is a healthy market uh, for the uh, continuous engineering product. Uh, you know, what do you think about the Microsoft GitHub acquisition? That you know they've got a strong IoT uh, product line. So does that impact us in any way? You see, okay, GitHub actually plays in a very different market space. So when you look at regulated industries where you're looking at products where uh, regulations or just the nature of the product that you're building requires the kind of tracking that you need to have, a GitHub doesn't meet those kind of requirements. There are certain standards in the automobile engineering space which our product is completely compliant with, which no other product is able to meet these requirements actually. So it's a, it's a hard market to be in, and uh, GitHub doesn't solve this problem. Great. And should we need uh, some deep hiring as an attempt to you know, kind of uh, drive some synergy between your services business and uh, continuous engineering product? Uh, so I, I think you should look at Sandeep and Chris uh, sort of as a team here rather than look at them just as individuals. Chris comes in with 
extensive experience of working in large companies, looking at billions of dollars of businesses. He also brings in a global face to the company, which is something that's very important in the direction we are change that we want to make. He's a person who's been set in the U.S. market. And in addition to that, you know, having worked with IP products, he brings that kind of an experience. So deep in the picture now, we have someone who is also fresh in the company, he works with Chris. He brings in experience of running our services business. So we will drive and ensure that the traditional services business uh, keeps moving at a greater growth rate than can be done. But then Chris has time to focus on marketing, how do we tell our stories, what should be our offering, and also working with some of our large customers. So I think the two of them will work in tandem. I help on the technology and the roadmap and also looking at sort of the future trends. And I think we are all looking at, at the company as one team trying to focus on the next generation growth of the business. So clearly we have made some mistakes in the past in terms of there are numbers of these, but you know, the only way to deal with mistakes is to correct them. So we have made some changes and uh, with this, this is where we are. I'd like to stop here and uh, we are at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being part of this call. Uh, we will do a next meetup uh, in, uh, on, say, in the week of 10th of June, and we will work with you on what is the most suitable date. And I know some of you have conferences at that time, so we will work around that. Uh, but we will find a date in that week uh, to have this next meeting. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for all your support.